Welcome to today's lecture. Uh, Rick had asked me to talk about um, protein ligand interactions and docking. Usually he does that in two sessions, uh, or he asked me to do it in two sessions. I've now tried to roll it into one. Um, so probably pretty often be skipping slides. Um, and he can also try to slow me down, then I'll just decide, okay, this is too much for, it to uh, for just one lecture. Um, okay. So briefly about myself, I'm a postdoc in uh, Brookhead's group and I come from chemistry. So I studied chemistry and then went from there into computational chemistry and um, drug design and stuff like that. And now I'm more in um, proteins and analyzing protein structures, etc. So this is um, also a bit um, looking back in time and in the time when I did the docking um, and I was in a group that developed docking methods. <coughs> okay, so why do we have a lecture about this in um, protein prediction in the first place? Um, one thing you can do with binding site analysis and docking, etc., is also find out something about the function of proteins. But the other um, idea of showing you this is um, showing you a bit about what do people do in drug design and what's, how does all this work. And that's the idea behind all this. Um, for the function prediction part, an interesting idea is the observation that similar proteins have similar interaction partners. Because if that is true, then if you find a similarity in the protein, you would be able to infer a similarity in the thing it does. Um, and some people have also made the effort of um, trying to challenge this hypothesis and find out whether it's true. Um, and an example of what they did is to um, look at loads of proteins and scan compound sets against different proteins um, and then see and then compare the binding constants they find for the ligands. And they made a network out of that. So the nodes in this network would be proteins and they've been colored by the um, groups they belong to. So especially the, the um, bioinformaticians and pharma companies colored by typical pharmacological target groups. Um, and they made an edge between two proteins if they could find at least one ligand that binds to both proteins and where the difference in the binding constant um, is uh, less than a factor thousand. Okay, so they have a similarity in binding. The other criterion was if they had loads of ligands that tested and there was just one ligand, they wouldn't make an edge, but then they would say that at least one-tenth of the ligands that has been tested would have to be within this range. And what you can see is at least that similarly colored things cluster together. So that the similarly colored things are things that would also be similar proteins. Um, but you also find some mixture. So you also find overlaps and in interactions um, between classes that you wouldn't usually class to classify together. So the take home message is similar proteins bind similar ligands is true overall, but you can't completely rely on that. Okay. Um, okay, so this idea of analyzing binding sites and comparing binding sites, what, what do we do this for? Why do we present this uh, to you? Well, one thing you can do with that is function prediction. Um, another thing is drug development. So if you have a drug against protein A, you can try to reuse that against protein B. That's actually done quite a lot because it saves you loads of cost. Um, because all the tox screening, etc., you can just reuse that. Um, the other thing why it saves you um, in drug development is that if you look at the whole target class um, and you have a set of compounds that you're testing, then you just test it against the whole class and you save the money for producing all the compounds and um, maybe if it doesn't hit against A, it at least hits against B and then you can use it for that. Um, the other reason why all this observation about similarity is important in drug development is for side effects. 
what you don't want to have in a drug is to interact with too many things you don't want it to interact with. Um, so it's very good if right from the start you can find out what else could my compound interact with so I can try to optimize against that. Or I can at least be aware of it. And if I if I find okay, it could cause this kind of side effect, then I can maybe cancel this whole project at an early stage. Um, and the pretty revolutionary idea in, in uh, pharma research is to um, turn this the story around of the side effects and say side effects are not negative, but it's actually something positive because rather than so I mean usually you all know the protein doesn't act all by itself but it's embedded in the whole network of pathways and, and interactions etc so instead of just shooting into the network at one point and trying to make an effect couldn't I try to tackle a whole area of my network and then get an effect by that. This is called polypharmacology or network pharmacology. But as I said, this is a pretty revolutionary idea because the, usually to get the drug approved, what you need to prove is that it acts against your target and you can, can defend why this is your target and it doesn't act against anything else because that will be side effects. Well, it's a new idea that's out there and maybe it's going to um, grow. Okay, um, so if I want to do um, 3D function prediction, um, I can um, predict the binding site and I can try to predict the ligand. Predicting the binding site is through analysis and finding the binding site, etc. Predicting the ligand would be through docking a whole set of um, compounds against the protein and then finding which one binds well and then I have hopefully found a function. Um, so what this lecture is going to be about um, is how do you binding sites, how do you analyze them, how do you find them, um, and um, in the second part I'm also going to talk about how do you dock, um, what are algorithms you use for that. Um, this is just to illustrate, most binding sites are a lot smaller than that one, this is a relatively uh, big one, but the, you can have some like that and then the um, amount of things or the variety of things that bind against it can also be pretty large. Um, so when we talk about the term binding site, um, not everybody always means the same thing. In the context of this lecture, I don't mean binding to other proteins, but of course if you just look for literature about binding sites, that is also something you might find. Um, the other thing that characterizes the binding site well, is... In the context of this lecture, the first part of the lecture. Well, protein-protein binding site is not what I'm talking about. And the second part of the protein pro no, no, not really. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, a small molecule um, protein, but not protein-protein. Um, what we are often dealing with is binding substrates. So a binding site is a place where the substrates bind, but of course it's also a place where cofactors bind. And if I want to find the function, then it might also be interesting to find out about the cofactor. Uh, what else characterizes the binding site, or what else do I often call the binding site? Well, a cavity in a protein, we usually assume something binds there, so we call it the binding site. Therefore, cavity and binding site is also sometimes used um, interchangeably. Um, and with the cavity idea you have to be a bit careful because not always can you really find the cavity if something binds there because sometimes you've got this induced fit thing um, and the cavity only really builds when the molecule um, is bound. This is just, you know, a small um, caveat. And um, if you want to find a binding site, the most easy way of doing that is to just take the PDB file and look for hat atoms. And in a lot of the cases, any stuff surrounding hat atoms is going to be a binding site. But we're going to look here at more difficult methods of finding binding sites in case you don't have a bound ligand. Just to say, you know, don't 
if ever you have to build a program for that, you shouldn't completely forget about the easy part. Hat atom finding is easy. Um, okay, so what does the binding site usually look like? Usually it's a pocket or a cleft in the protein. Um, we just did the exercise with the computational science guys. Uh, can you explain why a binding site, why it would be good to have a cleft or a pocket? Why not just on the surface? So if I want to bind a small molecule, why do I as a protein produce a pocket rather than just producing some area on the surface where it can bind? Yeah? Specificity, so only this a particular protein uh, ligand binds there. Okay, why can't I do that on the surface? Uh, maybe because uh, other ligands would bind there per a uh, random. Okay, maybe, maybe I didn't phrase my question right. So the question is, I mean, I can have specific interactions on the surface. What makes the pocket, like a cavity, better to achieve the specificity? It has three-dimensional constraints, which specifies the ligand much more than yeah, right, I've got a bigger surface, so I've got more interactions I can make. There are more reasons why it can be good to, to have a cavity, especially, for example, for enzymatic reactions, it's also good to have a cavity. Any ideas why? Well, often I want to do, so, especially if I have an enzymatic reaction, I want to do something on this thing, so I want to trap it there. Um, and also I want to keep the other stuff out. So I want to, to have, for example, A and B bind to each other, so I trap them together and they can't move so easily anymore and therefore a cavity is better. Okay, um, what do binding sites look like? Usually they're um, less hydrophobic than the normal interior of a protein. It's obvious, I mean, they have to interact with solvent. Um, and um, they're, of course, complementary to the thing they want to bind in form and interactions. Uh, so, if I want to develop a program to find binding sites, go through all of PDB and find binding sites, one thing I could do is just use the f feature that this is usually a pocket. Um, and in order to find out whether this is actually a good way of finding it, uh, Roman Laskowski did the analysis and looked at loads of enzymes and looked at in how many cases is it actually the largest pocket I'm really interested in and the answer is like in more than 80% of the cases. Just taking the largest pocket is going to do the job for me and I'm going to find the interesting binding sites. Um, and pretty early on there was already uh, um, a tool to do that and the way they did it is to place the protein inside a grid. Um, since that was in the 90s and the computers weren't so powerful, the grid was pretty uh, widely spaced. Three angstrom is quite a lot for proteins. Is that, um, is that clear for everyone? I mean, I, are you, I don't know how well you are used to handling proteins and structures, etc. So can you imagine something or, or a relation to something if I talk about three angstrom? So, for example, a H to H bond, in what order of magnitude would you estimate that? Yeah. Mm, yeah, right. So, the distance between one O to another O in a hydrogen bond would be on the order of three, three something, three, four, or something like that. Just to, to give you an idea, you know. <coughs> um, Okay, so they put the protein into a grid and now the, um, the task would be for the computer to find those grid points that are inside the protein. How do you do that? So you want to distinguish the things that have been marked by dots here um, from everything else that would be in the solvent. How would you do that? <laughs> 
I remember a method where you just simulate the ball which is rolling around the surface and um, with this rolling ball you could, um, for example, you have a much, much more dense region in these pockets because okay. the ball rolls like yeah. this and then you yeah. No, this is this is um, the, the 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 idea I'm getting at just here. It's, it's just taking the the, the grid point. Um, so the question would be, what distinguishes the grid points inside from the grid points outside? Okay, so. Um, what you can do is first you take every grid point and you look at is there a protein next to it then you mark the grid points as either belonging inside the protein or outside the protein and now you can take an axis and go along it and the points where you can go from protein to solvent and again to protein are obviously surrounded by protein so you take all three axes and then you look at proteins that are buried in um, ideally more than one axis and then you have grid points that are somehow surrounded by protein. And then you can take those points and cluster them together and then look for the largest cluster and you find a pocket. Um, okay. Yeah. Actually, from the idea, it's the same, right? If you if you roll the sphere, uh, I assume that your algorithm is faster to implement. But rolling a sphere is ultimately the same thing. You label the grid points. I mean, in 2D, you would define a sphere, and rolling a sphere would, would essentially again be you, you you move through the space through some simulated meeting algorithm, uh, and, and then you would simply use the same labels. I wonder whether yeah. ultimately at the end of the day these two ideas would exactly be the same. Yeah. It depends mm. on where you move, huh? Yeah, I think rolling the sphere is, is Yeah, the sphere is, is but it different. the sphere yeah. is, is a circle. And on yeah, the, then, the yeah, circle right. becomes a dot. Yeah. <laughs> and this particular situation actually is the same way. Yeah. Okay, so now assume you would want to improve on that method. What could you do? Well, what would be um, a shortcoming of the method? <coughs> well, one problem I pointed out in the beginning was um, three angstrom is pretty crude. So um, when you have more compute power, you can go to um, smaller distances. And actually, the next person who tried to improve on the um, method did exactly that. Um, Another thing which you couldn't know is that the way um, people were going through the, the, the grid point was pretty inefficient and so the person improved on that one, but that was trivial. Um, the final thing is um, currently we're only looking in three directions. Um, and if you want to find out more detail about your pocket, um, then you can add more directions. And what people did was to, to um, add their cubic diagonals and then they have more directions they look in. Um, and that method was called lick side, so here you see an example of cubic diagonals. And so you would look in every direction and then you would mark um, the grid points with how many times it is buried and how many directions it's buried. Um, and you can also look for an adjustable buriedness of the pocket. So you can say I want to look for only very buried pockets or I want to, to look for a wider pocket. Okay, so that is going through proteins and finding um, pockets just through geometry and it's pretty okay. Um, the other general idea is to say, well, the binding sites are points where my protein interacts with ligands, so I look for points where it has a favorable energy. And in order to be able to say where it has a favorable energy, I of course need to be able to, to um, calculate the energy in the first place. So um, we have to think about, okay, what kind of energies or what kind of interactions can we have? And um, I mean, I'm sure you 
learned about this in uh, loads of places before. Um, typical interactions within proteins are hydrogen bonds, salt bridges, metal complexes, and um, cation P, pi interactions. The latter one was something that I didn't learn about in textbooks, um, so people seem to have discovered that pretty recently. But actually, if you put the charge above a pi, so in a delocalized um, electron um, hull, that is actually a pretty strong interaction comparable to a hydrogen bond. Um, so it's also worthwhile to look for these in modern docking programs, etc. Also, um, take these into account. Um, okay, so apart from being able to um, predict where do things bind well, um, what do you do, does the energy um, have to do with binding? Well, you've, I'm sure you've learned about the chemical equilibrium and that um, a reaction always goes in both directions. So things can bind and fall apart again. You can characterize how well it binds um, for the dissociation constant. Um, so if I want to optimize for a strong binder, what do I want to have with the KD? Um, should it be, what, what order of magnitude should my KD be in so I have a strong binder? Smaller one? Sorry? Smaller one? Yeah, right, smaller than one. <coughs> and the, um, so I've got concentrations here, so the, the, um, uh, dimension this always has, um, is a concentration. So, um, and a good, a good binder we aim for in truck design would be in the micromolar range or below that. Okay, um, what you find from chemistry is that the um, binding constant is related to the free energy of binding. And therefore, if we can predict the free energy of binding, we can also say something about the binding constant. But I have to say, this is uh, very ambitious. <laughs> because um, the free energy of binding contains this um, uh, entropy term. So a measure for disorder or how many states can this thing be in and still have, or how many different ways are there of realizing the state and this is really hard to estimate. Therefore what our, all our scoring usually does um, is mainly focus on the energy and only to a very lo a little part can we estimate the entropy. This is something to bear in mind when you look at scoring and docking programs, etc. Um, if we want to make, um, or if we want to know how strong are the interactions, what do we need to to, to look at? Um, we can can look for what kinds of experimental data can I find. And one thing people have been looking at is measuring interactions in the gas phase. That's pretty easy to measure. Um, and there you see that, for example, a charge interaction is far more uh, strong than, for example, a hydrophobic interaction. But it's very hard to transfer this kind of data into um, the watery solution because um, water shields the, um, the uh, charged interactions a lot. But still, it gives you an idea for the order of magnitude of um, how strong are interactions in general. Um, another thing people have been wondering a lot about is can I, how can I go about to estimate the strength of a H bond, for example? And then what they do is to look at the binding of different molecules. Um, different molecules that are in principle very similar. So um, here we've got one compound and we let it bind to uh, one version of a protein which has got a proline here and one which has got the leucine here. Um, in case of the leucine, um, I, I can make a H bond. In case of the proline, I can't make a H bond. And now I can, can um, measure the difference in the binding between these two um, complexes. Um, and there are also ways of um, attributing that to um, entropic term and, and energy term. 
So from that, I would say the difference of having a H bond or not having a H bond um, is 7.8 um, kilojoule per mole. Nice answer. But then um, you can do the same thing again um, and have a slightly different molecule, which would um, where, where the the interaction would be transferred via a water molecule. It's still the question of having the H bond or not. But here, a water molecule is involved. And in that case, um, the delta delta G is pretty uh, different. So um, here it's uh, minus 0 0.8, where, where there it's um, plus 7.8. So the take home message from that, it's very hard to predict the effect of H bonds. <coughs> Okay, um, otherwise, if we want to, to um, calculate energies, we go back to physics, and um, the, the charged interactions are relatively easy to describe um, physically. It's the Coulomb potential. Um, there, um, if you have two hydrophobic parts coming close to each other, we need to look at how do the electron shells interact. And this is usually approximated by um, a Lena Jones potential. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about force fields, etc., before somewhere. Actually, just to have an idea of um, whether I'm telling you something you've heard before or not. Um, how many of you have been doing something with molecular dynamics, force fields, etc., before? You have. Otherwise, not. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, um, okay, then, then I know that I don't skip too much about, uh, um, here. The, if you have two non-charged um, compounds coming close to each other, um, what they're going to feel first is that one electron shell um, approaches the other electron shell. And um, due to some random shifts, there is often a slight dipole, a very slight dipole um, in, in one of the molecules. And then when that comes close to the other one, it induces um, also a, a shift in the electron density in the other molecule, so you suddenly have two dipoles, and they attract each other. And that's why when they come close to each other, you first have an attractive force here. And then when they come even closer, you get a repulsive force um, because suddenly the electrons get too close and they re repel each other and the cores repel each other and everything. Um, so that means there is a minimum where the compounds kind of feel well close to each other and then it goes up and you, they mustn't overlap too much. And the other thing which you should always keep in mind when you try to, to compute energies is, as I said, there's this entropic term. So when, you, um, when a ligand binds to a receptor, then um, some freedoms of um, movement get trapped and um, you lose entropy. That's the term that we really have difficulty in um, predicting. Um, Okay, now coming back to this thing that we want to predict where the binding set is by looking at energies. Um, there we want to find the locations where we would have favorable interaction energies. Um, and the first tool that did that was called GRID because it placed a protein into a grid and then for every grid point would calculate the different terms of interactions I can have. The charge, um, the Lena jones interactions and also um, it had a term for a directional H bond. So it had parameterized um, something such that you could say, okay, I probably have this contribution of a H bond here. Where again, I told you it's not so easy to calculate that really. Um, and you could have different kinds of probes. So you could imagine that you have a CH, uh, CH4 which goes through all the grid and you would calculate the energies it would find in every point in the grid. You could imagine you have an OH group and you would again calculate it for that based on those parameters. And with that you could try and characterize the binding site and find places where it would be favorable to have interactions. When you do that, um, I unfortunately didn't find any good pictures for that. 
Um, when you do that, um, you in the end can, can highlight densities of, okay, hydrophobic interaction would be good in these areas, um, a hydrogen bond uh, acceptor would be good in these areas, hydrogen bond donor would be good in these areas. And then you can try and cluster them together and make a binding site out of that. Um, GRID itself was mainly used in order to, to analyze the binding site, to have a visual idea and also especially if you already have a ligand bound to a protein and you want to have ideas how can I extend this ligand, where are the possible interactions that I haven't used, then this can be pretty helpful. Um, so a method that was implemented on top of GRID in order to automatically find binding sites was called Q-Site Finder. Um, it just used a methyl probe, so something which doesn't have OH and at all. And my criticism of that would be that in the end this is not very different from geometric um, testing. Because, um, you know, methyl probe doesn't make so many different kinds of interactions. <coughs> um, and yeah, then when you've marked every point in the grid uh, with an energy, you can try to find adjacent grid points that meet a certain energy criterion. Um, and they tested the method and found that um, this connected, biggest connected cluster would usually, or in 70% of the cases, this would be um, the binding site that is also experimentally found. And if you have different clusters which are scored differently than among the first three, you would usually find the real one. Um, and they also test how well does the predicted binding site overlap um, with a true ligand, and that would be 70% overlap. This is especially relevant if you want to automatically extract binding sites from a large data set and then work on those. Then you want to be able to rely on the, on the tool that you really get the relevant sites. Of course, if you're, otherwise, if you, if you work on a protein and, and you do drug design for that, then you would, of course, go in by hand and look at that. But like for 100,000 structures, you can't do that. Um, okay, some challenges to keep in mind when you want to automatically identify binding sites. Uh, one thing is that protein flexibility can hide your binding site um, because um, and what you can do in order to counter that is to use multiple experimental confirmations. Often people, you know, when you go through PDB, um, you take, for example, the, the structure with the best resolution or something and you discard all, everything else. And my message here is that can be, um, can, can be a mistake because maybe in one confirmation you see the binding site and the other one you don't and so you shouldn't be too fast about throwing away stuff. Um, and another thing if you want to be absolutely sure that you are going to see the cavities is that you can run stuff through molecular dynamics and maybe then something is going to come up but of course this is a very demanding uh, way of doing things. So you would only do that if you really want to focus on a certain group of proteins or something like that. Um, and the other thing is um, if you have a dimer, um, so your protein naturally exists as a dimer and you only look for cavities in your monomer, you might not see that because the actual cavity might be built by both parts of your dimer. So before you would go through a data set, it would be helpful to, to really carefully um, analyze the data set and, and um, look at um, the um, information about the protein and whether, whether you find anything. And um, nowadays in PDB, you've got the um, biological unit rather than the um, unit cell. Do you know what I mean if I talk about unit cell and the PDB structure? If not, please ask. <laughs> Can anyone explain what a unit cell is in a PDB structure? <laughs> 
in general, you should ask if people assume you know something. Um, we often have no idea what you've learned and what you haven't, so you should ask. Mm, yeah, please explain. Okay. Both, but I'm not sure anymore. Um, so. The way structures are um, determined is that we take the protein and we make it crystallize, which is usually not the environment it would be in, but we make it crystallize so that we have the same protein again and again uh, next to each other in a crystal. That's what a crystal is about. Then the way this thing arranges is that you have some geometric unit that gets repeated. This is what we call the unit cell. Sometimes a protein might crystallize in a way that it builds a dimer, although it's not naturally a dimer, or it might build a, a tetramer, and that this assembly of three things would be the stuff that is repeated again and again in the crystal. But the thing that we find again and repeat it in the crystal not, need not be the thing that is usually um, biologically. Um, the same, and the crystallographers also do some um, some geometric operations in the analysis of the refraction data, such that even if the thing is inverted a bit, they might still identify this as the repetitive unit. So you might not see the dimerization in if you only look at the coordinates that are um, there in the PDB structure. That's why this biological unit has been introduced and I would encourage you to, whenever you look at a PDB structure in more detail, look, is there a biological unit that has been defined? And if yes, then look at that and not um, just at the PDB file itself. Um, okay, so this is um, some challenges to keep in mind and also for you in general, if you work with structures, um, keep that in mind. Um, okay, so if we want to analyze protein ligand neutralizers, now we've found binding sites, and now we want to find out where can ligands bind, what could bind there, and um, can we generate any ideas of what could bind there, etc. So that's the, the topic now. If we want, so if we want to analyze protein ligand interactions, um, we are going to look for the kinds of interactions I talked about before. We're going to look for uh, ions, hydrogen bonds, metal coordination, cation pi interactions, um, and um, also pi stacking. These are the typical interactions we, we look for and we want to optimize for. Um, okay. What I'm doing for time. Okay. I think I'm going to skip a bit about this mapping stuff to um, proteins. Um, just a general observation if you want to get a general idea, what you often do is to take a graphics program and map a feature onto um, the protein. Um, this is the exact res result you get is often a bit a question of the parameterization of the program that maps features onto the protein. So if you want to learn something about two different proteins and compare them, you should at least make sure that your graphics is done by the same thing. Because the result you get might be different really depending on the parameters. Um, you wouldn't find that a binding site is completely positively charged if indeed it is negatively charged. That's not the case. But if you want to compare two things and really say one is more positively charged than the other one, then I would make sure that I'm using the same parameterization for both. Um, for characterizing binding sites, I told you about GRID before, um, which based on predictions um, would be able to, to mark points where you can have a uh, hydrogen bond, whatever. Um, there's also the idea to use knowledge. This is something that is going to come uh, quite a lot in this lecture again. Um, there are always different different bases you can make your predictions on. You can try to go to, to first principles and try to predict everything from uh, physics. Or you can say, okay, I've got, I've assembled loads of knowledge of protein structures, protein interactions, etc., and I'm going to just take that knowledge and map it onto the other um, context. And what I'm showing you here is one of this. Um, 
in order to characterize um, or find ideas where something might interact in a protein binding site, people had the idea, okay, we've got loads of structures of small molecules. Just, I don't know, uh, a benzene or something a bit more complex, ethanol or whatever, and that has been crystallized and the structure has been determined. And for that, you can in, very, in, in, in really good detail see the, the distances and angles, etc. So you can get a lot of information about how do different functional groups interact from the small molecule data. And the idea of Superstar is to take all this small molecule data and the probability of having group A and that distance of group B, etc., and just map it onto the protein. Because you can also split, I mean, proteins are a lot simpler than general organic chemistry. Um, and when I say that, I often have to think of my organic chemistry professor. He was really pissed because I wanted to get into um, bio uh, biochemistry. And he said, well, that's so boring. <laughs> um, but anyway, so a protein is really rather sim uh, simple organic chemistry compound, so you can take all the information from the um, normal organic chemistry and map it onto the protein. Um, <coughs> so what you do is um, you make density maps of the, of the um, interactions you get from the uh, crystals, um, you break the protein into fragments, and then you map the density maps onto the protein. Um, okay, so now if we want to get to the, to the point that we want to find function or predict function based on similarity or we want to, for example, find something else our protein or ligand might interact with based on the similarity of the two targets, what do we have to do? Well, the first thing to do in order to be able to compare binding sites is that we somehow have to get them map each other to each other in 3D. Um, and then we can start and analyze the differences, and the differences we're going to analyze are mainly those that are relevant for the interactions. Um, but we can also go for some, something sim uh, simple, like the pocket sites or something like that. Aligning is pretty straightforward in case your proteins have a similar sequence. Because then you can work out which residues should be placed on top of each other. That's simple. Um, it's still relatively simple in case you have a similar overall 3D structure. Because then you can at least align all the secondary structure elements and we've got tools for doing the 3D alignment. The really hard case is in cases where it, Two things bind more or less the same compound, but the protein is made up completely differently. It's like um, convergent evolution, where you two organisms have the, want to solve the same task, and they've developed different things that do it, but they end up in more or less the same place. Um, and that is really interesting to find. Um, for the more, if you ever want to compare two binding sites, you have the task and want to find out what's different about them. Um, a tool you could use is ReadyBase, and this is more for the, uh, for the easy cases where you have sequence or structural similarity. And this is going to analyze the binding site for you, and you can switch on and off the different ligands, you can switch on and off the, the hydrogens, uh, the, the water molecules, um, and it's going to tell you which C alphas have moved how much in what direction, etc. So, you know, if you would ever end up in a drug uh, design company or something, or a pharma company, then this would, might be a task you have. And so ReliBase is a useful tool for that. Um, so I said the really interesting part is where the um, structures and sequences are not similar. And I'm going to show you a method that was developed in order to find that. Um, an example where this could be, uh, or th this kind of similarity can be found are these two proteins. Um, you can see one is a kinase and one is a reductase, so they also do different things on the molecule. Um, the parts, are in, at first sight, they also uh, look pretty different, but actually they have a part of the, the compound they act on which is similar. 
Um, and for finding function, it can help you to find this similarity. Then you can say, okay, this, is, this other thing is also probably going to find something similar to that one. Um, if you look at how these things interact, um, it's always helpful to, to go to PDB sum, which in, includes um, lick plots, and then you can see this map to 2D, and it's going to highlight the interactions for you. But this still looks pretty dissimilar. <laughs> Only if you really focus down to, uh, to the actual part of the structure that is similar, you start to see that the interactions are also similar. For example, here we've gotten um, an NH2 group, which interacts with a carbonyl group, and you know, the other protein also binds this more to by binding to a carbonyl group, and the adjacent N is bound not by an OH or something, but by an NH2. So you see the same pattern of interaction in, in both um, structures, only in one case this, is, this comes from two different amino acids, whereas here it comes from the same amino acid. But the location of the interaction sites in the protein in the end is pretty similar. And identifying that is really the challenge. Um, <coughs> so, um, what, we, what do we need to do in order to, to solve this problem where we have to locate the binding sites, um, which we talked bef about before? Um, we have to be able to capture the inf important features, um, and then we have to be able to search efficiently across all the structures. Um, one thing is finding the superimpositioning, and the other one is f um, scoring the thing. Um, I'm going to show you one example. Um, <laughs> But there are more out there, and they differ in the in the approach how they um, represent the the molecules, how they do the searching, etc. So for every of these tasks I described, there are different ways of of trying to solve the task. And if I show you an example, this is just to to get you an idea of how how you can do that. But that doesn't mean that is the only solution for it. And every solution is, can have its um, uh, advantages or drawbacks. Um, so, for example, you can, if you want to represent the structure, you can either go for atoms or you can go for chemical groups. Um, you can also take the C-alphas, for example. The difference would be that if you take um, the actual atoms, then you have loads of points you need to compare. If you take functional groups, then you limit that already to the things that is relevant for the interaction. If you go to C alphas, you've got a lot less to compare, but you, it's harder to really describe the interaction. And it's a lot less specific in, in, in how, yeah, how well you can, can um, find the, the exact localizations. Um, Okay, so the example I'm showing here um, is Lixa, uh, is um, based on Rallybase, and they also use the, the Lixite program, which I um, showed before, for detecting mining sites. So for this program, the binding site finding was already done. Um, and then every uh, residue next to the binding site uh, would be taken apart and analyzed, and it, um, every donor point would be marked as, okay, this is a hydrogen bond donor, acceptor is hydrogen bond acceptor, you can have something that has both, and the other um, properties they uh, focused on was aliphatic, so that would be CA3, things like that, um, or pi, that pi is always something that has um, delocalized electrons. Um, and one residue can have also be characterized by several centers um, if it can make several interactions. So this is a very detailed way of um, mapping a binding site. Um, and now, if you want to compare two binding sites, you have to find the set of interaction sites that you can map onto each other, um, which is geometrically um, compatible. And 
in many of the tools I'm going to show you, you find the same pattern. You have interest, so if you want to, to um, dock ligands to a structure, then you, want, then you have interaction points relative to the ligand, which you want to place on top of interaction points relative to, to the protein. If you want to compare two proteins, you have interaction points inside the pocket, which you want to put onto interaction points on the, on the other pocket. And there's also the task which I'm not going to talk about, but which does the same thing again. If you want to compare two ligands, you have the interaction sites around the ligands, uh, around ligand A, and the interaction sites around ligand B, and you want to pay, place them on top of each other. And of course, all the people who develop a method for one of the tasks also know about the other tasks, so the ideas get um, shifted from one to the other. So when you go through like docking tools and structure alignment tools, etc., you're going to find the same kind of solutions again and again. Um, so what's this, this general principle that very often reoccurs? Um, you do the alignment by creating a graph. So for molecule A, um, a graph consists of all the interaction sites in um, molecule A. You have a node that is characterized um, by the type of interactions it can make. Um, so if in molecule A you have an OH group, that would be a hydrogen bond donor, and you have one node for that. Then if it also has, I don't know, a pi um, a ring or something, then that would be um, a pi center in there. And now I have two nodes and they are connected by an edge which is annotated with the distance of the two centers. So you have the 3D structure and you know the distance of the two centers and your edge gets annotated with that distance. And if the distance is too big, you don't make the edge because it gets irrelevant and you get too many connections. Okay? Good, so now I've characterized my, protein, my, my molecule A. I do the same thing for molecule B. If I want to superimpose those two, then I need to find which pairs of nodes do I need to make. So I need to find a node from A, a node from B. They need to have the same kind of interaction type, otherwise it would be no, there would be no point in superimposing. Um, and if I now also want to... Um, I, if I want to superimpose, I want to find that set of nodes that fit geometrically. So I find pair um, nodes from A, node from B, uh, node 2 from A, node 2 from B. They have similar um, properties and now they also need to have similar distances in A, similar distance in B, otherwise I wouldn't be able to superimpose them. Okay, that's what I want to find. And in order to do that, I create an associated graph. In my associated graph, I take a node from protein A and a node from protein EB that has similar properties. So I get loads of pairs. You can do the, um, uh, what's it called? Um, and um, now, you, but you only draw an edge between these nodes um, if the <coughs> uh, pairs within molecule A and within molecule B have a compatible distance. Um, and the distance difference in this example um, that was tolerated was two angstrom, which is actually pretty, or which can be actually pretty much if you think of the order of magnitudes. And, um, but that is what worked. Um, and then based on that, you can do, you can try to find the maximal common subgraph and that will be the set of equivalencies that is compatible. And then you have the alignment. Now you have a set of nodes that fit together, but you usually find more than one set that would fit together. So the question is, which is more relevant? Now comes the task of scoring. And... Um, you could try to define a measure of similarity between the nodes, it's that much charged or whatever. Um, but in this case, what, um, uh, what they did was to look at the, they mapped the features to the surface because they thought, okay, the surface is the thing that really 
extends to the ligand in the end. And if the surface patches are most similar, then I probably also have the most similar pocket. Um, so every, um, every pocket would then be characterized by, by many points of this um, surface, and then they can look at uh, surface patches and how similar they are. And that would be the scoring. And um, with this method, um, they, for example, uh, searched um, the whole database with one uh, protein um, against all of PDB. Um, and they found um, cavities, uh, loads of uh, some cavities that have a similar fold. So that were, were the more or less trivial cases, which you could also have found without this method. Um, but finally, they also found um, the uh, structurally unrelated protein, which I had showed you before. So it actually works to really find based just on the kinds of interactions that uh, it makes. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the other method. Um, and go to, to docking. Um, when you want to find out how a ligand can bind into a pocket, um, then you again have the, the problem of trying to orient it somewhere, uh, somehow in 3D, um, and of um, scoring it. And I'm going, what I'm going to talk about is um, how you do that, scoring and positioning the ligands. I'm going to show you one or two example programs. Uh, I'm going to say a bit about the performance and maybe I'll um, get to the example application. I don't know. Um, so, just to, to illustrate the, the difficulty in this, um, um, when I want to score, uh, it would be nice if I could find some correlation. So, for example, the more hedge bonds I have, the better my, my compound binds. But um, it's not really straightforward. And the other idea was to say, okay, my, my strength of binding would depend on the buried lipophilic surface area. And again, well, there is a correlation, but it's not really, you know, striking. Um, so also coming from the experimental data, um, we can say this is not a trivial task. Um, if you want to, to optimize a ligand and have something that binds strongly, so your task is you work in a drug uh, discovery company and you want to find something that is going to make a good um, drug, um, there are some rules of thumb that you can try to observe. Uh, one is that it helps to have lipophilic contacts. So if your pocket contains a lipophilic area, then make sure your, your ligand also contains a lipophilic area that you can put there. Because then you're going to display some water molecules, which are going to be very happily swim around and bring entropy. Um, the other thing is, Putting in H bonds by design doesn't really help. As I said before, um, you can't really say more H bonds makes better binding. But um, if you have a polar atom either inside your ligand or inside your protein, and you put something nonpolar next to it, that's definitely a bad idea. So just counting more H bonds doesn't help, but on the other hand, so make sure you don't bury anything. Um, and the other thing which might not be obvious on first sight, it's good if this thing is rigid. The more rigid it is, the less um, freedoms, um, degrees of freedom does it lose when it binds, and the less entropy you lose. Okay. Um. <coughs> So if I want to calculate how does my ligand bind to the protein, I need to be able to uh, distinguish likely and unlikely conformations of the ligand. Um, but it's one task, so I have one ligand binding to one protein and I just want to find out how it's going to bind. The other task we might be talking about is I have loads of ligands and I want to have know which one of these is going to bind tightly and which one isn't. 
And sometimes the performance of a method on what you use might depend a little on, on what task you want to solve. Um, the problem of how does my ligand bind to the protein is especially interesting if you want to then optimize on the ligand. So you, you've, you've done a test in the lab, you find out this ligand binds, you don't have a crystal structure for it, you know, want to know, okay, why does it actually bind and could I optimize on that? Then you want to know where does it bind and what could, could I do to fill the pocket better, etc. The other thing is I haven't found my... my um, good compound yet and I want to screen and I want to know which library of um, ligands am I going to really screen in the experiment. Then I need this other task distinguishing good from bad binders because then I can focus better. Um, in all of this our assumption is that in the bound state I have a defined minimum so I can in the first place predict it and if this thing is moving around then there's no point in, in predicting the best pose. Um, when I want to start predicting binding energies, I need to, to keep in mind that not only does the protein and the ligand interact, but within the protein and within the ligand I also have movement, and the different conformations can mean different energies. Um, so this is showing the example of um, torsions within um, a compound and um, if the bulkiest part are aligned to each other um, then um, you have quite a lot of energy difference to the, the lowest thing where they pose in, uh, in opposite directions. Okay, so um, how do we usually capture these energies? Um, what is done in almost any um, force field scoring function, etc., um, is to capture the, the internal energies um, by approximating them with springs. So you have a spring for the bond length, you have a spring for the angle, and you have, now this is not a spring, you have a term for the torsion. Um, and you more or less find that everywhere and the interesting question is um, here you've got um, minimum uh, or the, the, the optimal length and you also have a constant for how strong is the spring um, and if you imagine how many atom types we have um, then you can imagine that you have quite a lot of parameters you can fit in, in there which then make a difference in how you predict the binding energy and then there are different approaches and where you find these binding constants. Um, one approach for this um, is so-called force field based um, scoring functions. I'm showing you the, the, the terms that are used in term in Ember. Uh, I'm not expecting you to be able to write these down anywhere. <laughs> Just to if you see them somewhere that you can in the future be happy and say, yeah, I've seen that before, I know what they mean. Um, so you see that in, in both uh, force fields, you, for example, have this uh, bond spring term, you've got the angled spring term, you've got this here and there, you've got the torsion term, uh, which is called dihedrals here. Um, and then for the non-bonded interactions, you've got the, the Lennard-Jones potential, which I showed you before, and you've got the Coulomb potential. So you see these things are pretty similar. Um, they're dissimilar in that um, in CHARM they try to, to also um, capture some, um, some other kinds of, um, uh, of angles on top and trying to, to parameterize even more precisely with that. Now where do the parameters come from? In this case, um, they observe uh, mostly small molecules in, um, in spectra, etc. and from the, um, from for example, the frequency of finding some bond shifts, etc. in the spectra, um, they can then try to infer the binding constant. So this comes more from first principles and more from physics. The other approach is to say, well, but instead of coming from the small molecules and the physics, I observe what I find in proteins and interactions. Um, so I collect lots of parameters from binding data, 
and I do a regression analysis to find out all my parameters in there. This is more tailored towards really protein ligand interactions and in these kinds of scoring functions um, they also introduce some terms that help to capture um, uh, entropy a little. So for example things for um, buried surface area. But otherwise the, the um, scoring functions often look pretty similar to the force field I showed you before. Um, and again, I'm going to skip that one. Um, okay, now when we let's assume we have found a term describing how we want to score this in the end. I showed you the different ways of deriving that. Um, now we need to search through the search space. And just to make it clear how big this search space is, um, we just have three degrees of freedom for the, the center of mass. We have three degrees of freedom for the orientation. Uh, but then, in theory, we also have loads of degrees of freedom for the movement inside the protein and quite a bit for the movement inside the ligand. <coughs> the oldest docking tools said, okay, I'm not going to care about the protein. I assume I know what the protein looks like and nothing in there moves. Um, they also said, well, I'm going to calculate a few conformations for the ligand and then I'm going to try out these uh, because I can't move, deal with that lot of flexibility either. So that's where we come from. That the ligand has become more flexible has happened over the last, um, I'd say, 20 years or something. Um, the, nowadays the protein is also becoming more flexible, but it's still, it's a challenge. Um, so, uh, uh, what's she called? Uh, Antis, um, for example, is working on this um, flexibility thing with the docking. Um, and I've told her practical is interesting. So, if you're interested in this kind of thing, then apparently it's a nice thing to do. Um, okay, so um, there are loads of docking programs. And I've got no chance to, to show you nearly a tenth or whatever. Um, what I did is to try and classify them a bit by what makes them different, what is similar. Um, but if you go through this list, you're going to see that um, in, in my classification, some reoccur. So Autodoc, for example, is a program that implements loads of different algorithms and you can just try out what works best for you in your case. Um, Okay, so the general idea is um, DOC, one of the oldest ones, does a general shape matching for getting the ligand in there. Um, flex and slide um, build up the ligand inside the pocket incrementally. Um, this helps making the ligand flexible. So you take an anchor and then you grow from there and then you can, if you um, have an efficient way of going through your search tree, um, then you can, can better evaluate different um, angles for the, the different torsions, etc. Um, and um, there are other things like genetic algorithms and simulated annealing and Monte Carlo methods which are all for going through the uh, different approaches for going through the search space. Um, <coughs> so DOC again was um, one of the, the first um, to do this docking. Um, the general idea was to represent the binding site um, by a set of spheres and also to present the ligand by a set of spheres and then you would match the spheres onto each other. And just like mapping the binding sites onto, one, uh, onto each other here you map the imprint onto the binding site. Um, <coughs> so the different uh, phases this goes to is to first um, calculate the surface, then fill the active site with spheres, a bit like what you mentioned, um, and then mark the spheres with different properties depending on what are the kinds of interactions you can find next to it. Um, and 
then you would go through the uh, ligand atoms and the protein spheres and again do this exercise of having the graphs. Um, and yeah, um, so the, the best match would be the uh, clique in them um, or it, so what is often, a word that is often mentioned in that context is clique and that means a com uh, completely connected subgraph that is the set of nodes that together make up uh, the, the biggest superimpositioning. Um, later, because I said Doc was very old, um, they didn't want to drop their program but also introduced ligand flexibility in there. Um, so they said, okay, instead of just placing the whole molecule, I'm going to place an anchor. Um, find the best position from the, for that and then I'm going to attach something to the anchor and find the best position again and grow. Um, that's how they introduced um, flexibility into dock and um, especially for that level such that the, then the challenge again is if you have a very difficult scoring function then it takes ages to, to calculate and you can't do that for every pose that you want to try. Um, therefore in DOC they have two different scoring schemes and those depend on which level you're at. So for a first crude search they take a cruder um, scoring then in the end for really ranking the stuff with respect to each other. Um, and you can also uh, basically put in everything in doc so you can have just looking for bump checks so that the electron helds don't um, overlap. Um, you can have the ember force field, you can have the grid which I mentioned before. Um, and yeah, since doc was around loads of people put in stuff. Um, Which one am I going to? <clears throat> so, the other thing is that there is loads of literature about how well do docking programs perform. Um, and when I first prepared this lecture, I wanted to give you a good picture of how good they are. Uh, the problem you get is that very often docking tools are evaluated by the people who develop their docking tools. And so the way they evaluate is going, or the, 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 the thing they publish is of course the thing that makes their pro docking program um, look best. And there are loads of different ways you can look at docking programs and evaluate. And so it's not so easy to get a, a fair picture of, uh, of the comparisons. But what are the comparisons we can do in the first place? Well, one thing is we can say, okay, we have crystal structures and we look at, can my um, docking program reproduce the crystal structure? Um, another thing is I have different ligands I score and then I rank them with respect to each other. And then I look, um, is the ranking from my scoring similar to the ranking I get by the binding constants? And um, the first thing is I do a database search and I look how many of the good compounds do I get back if I take, for example, just the top tenth of the scores or something like that. That's called what, that is called the enrichment. Um, so. Um, how many hits do I have um, which are selected relative to the total hits and um, I compare that to the number of molecules I select compared to the total number of molecules and I want the fraction of hits I get to be bigger than fraction. Okay, um, now I'm going to show you a bit of statistics on different um, docking programs, um, but again, this is just a selection and if you take some other comparisons, you might also get to some other results. Um, so this is just to illustrate the, the, the order of magnitude. Um, just one example I, I had been working with anyway. So in green you see what the um, experimental structure looks like, how the ligand looks, um, sits in there. Um, in blue you see what the docking program produced in first rank. Um, and so you see that inside there, I mean, it put the right part, and this is a pretty flexible um, ligand, so it's, it's, it's a rather hard task. Um, 
so it put the right end of the of the molecule inside and the other one was sticking out um, but up here the the difference is pretty big so the RMSD of that was like um, above three or something like that um, and uh, for comparison I'm, I'm also showing the best result so that was really closest to the um, to the actual structure um, that would be in the order of one um, axiom RMSD, uh, but that was not on first rank. And um, another big decision uh, discussion in the people who evaluate um, docking programs is actually is the crystal structure the best reference? Um, because you know when you when you dock you simulate the the environment that you have really the water around it, but in the crystal structure the surrounding is more like you, you have the next protein next to it um, so maybe the uh, pose of the ligand is also influenced that by the fact that the pocket is not just as big as it looks in the, in the watery solution that's a big discussion um. Um, okay so just to give you an, an idea of orders of magnitude we're talking about what the people did uh, for this test was to take loads of ligands, loads of proteins, and loads of different um, docking tools. And because they wanted to make the, the tools comparable in a way, they didn't always use their, their way of handling flexibility, but they fed them with different um, conformations of the ligand. Um, that's what the different symbols um, show. <coughs> so they would take the ligand and exactly the conformation it has in um, the crystal structure, and then they would um, calculate some other conformations um, with another tool and give the docking program that and ask it to dock rigidly. Okay? Um, and then they looked at was the docking program able to reproduce the, um, the, the way the ligand fits into the protein um, at the first rank? So the, the first rank solution, does it look like the real solution? Um, and for the best method, um, in 60% of the cases, um, it was able to reproduce um, the real pose. And the um, RMSD you would have on average for these cases was in the order of 2.5. Okay? Um, and you see that the performance does depend on what kind of confirmation um, you give to the uh, program, but you would usually expect that redocking the real structure should be the best, and you don't really see that. And that is probably because the scoring functions, I mean, if the real solution uh, in some place comes closer to the protein than the scoring function would allow, then the docking program wouldn't be able to, to put in the, the um, ligand in that confirmation and it would just say, no, it doesn't work. <coughs> okay, but this gives you an order, so, so an idea of what is the performance you can get from, from the docking programs. If you don't look at the top score, but if you say, okay, I, I, I let my docking program give me 100 solutions or more for every uh, ligand, and then I look which one comes closest to the real solution, um, then we get into different um, orders of magnitude, or yeah, different uh, numbers. So the best method would um, get something at 1.5 angstrom, and um, also in more than 80% of the cases, it would get the re real solution. Which is why people who really work with docking tools don't just look at the top score, um, but they look at at least the first 10, if not the first 100. Um, okay. Sorry? In your cases, always flex X was really bad. Yeah, I was um, wondering about that because I think... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> as, so I think the problem is that um, here they gave it uh, um, a defined confirmation. So flux is especially good in um, generating a pose by growing the ligand. And here it didn't have the chance to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so the people who did the comparison um, tried to to make it more comparable by giving a different, uh, a predefined confirmation. Um, but this is the problem in this comparison that the, if a tool is based on making its own confirmation, it doesn't perform here. But it was the one with the with the widest set of um, comparisons I found. That's why I chose that one to to show. Otherwise, yeah, I'm. Uh, so the, the, the group I did my PhD in um, was also involved in working with the FlexX people. So I hate to show that FlexX is bad. <laughs> um. <coughs> yeah, the other thing is um, trying to correlate with um, experimental affinities. Um, just to, there was one, one um, uh, one publication that compared different methods on how well does the docking score correlate with the um, with the experimental affinity, and you see that the correlation coefficients, no matter which one you pick, are pretty low. So you shouldn't really rely on um, I. Oh. I have the well, I have this um, this one is ranked better than that one, therefore this ligand is better than that one. That is very very hard to say. Um, that said, you have also to take into account that if you accumulate the um, your data you're working with from different labs. So if we're different labs um, measure the same binding constant between a protein and a ligand. Um, you have at least a factor of 10 that can be different between them. Um, and in the lab where I did my PhD, we had a PhD student who was working on measuring and he sometimes gave talks about, you know, I changed this and I changed that and this is how much my values changed. So it's mm, a bit tricky to actually work out under what conditions you really want to measure this in order to get something comparable. So in case you ever want to make a study like that, it's best to get values only from one lab, and then you can start looking for correlations. But I think that's what they did here. <coughs> um, okay, just to round this up, a nice example of where docking has been used. I mean, even though it's all pretty difficult, you can still do something with docking because it still helps you select stuff. Um, if you look at enough of the solutions. Um, so one study that was done was um, to try and find a drug um, that would uh, bind in HIV, um, even though um, the protein uh, keeps mutating away from um, your drug. And <coughs> so um, they docked a library of molecules against the wild type and a few mutant structures. Um, and then they looked at the top scores and did an intersection of them, and they also redocked and rescored those to make sure they have comparable values. And then they visually actually inspected 1,500 structures. <laughs> so they did a human scoring on top of that. Um, they narrowed their uh, study down to, ta uh, to nine compounds which they really tested. And three of them were really hits um, against the wild type and the mutant. And so they tried to um, continue from there. So the summary of um, the lecture is um, so <coughs> um, you can get correct structures in about 70% of the test cases for, um, from docking. Predicting binding affinity is very difficult. Um, ranking complex geometries works okay-ish. Ranking different uh, ligands has pretty weak correlations and free energy estimation, so I mean not just ranking with respect to each other, but really predicting the binding constant, that is more or less unsolved problem thing. So if you want to find something to do, you can work on that. Um, and the big challenges lie in handling protein flexibility, because that just introduces so many more degrees of freedom. Um, and um, yeah, improving the reliability but still, it's better than random guessing and it can save you time. Okay, so that's it.